Well, this morning we're going to continue on through our series, uh, uh, Christian Characters with Character. And we're going to be uh, taking a little bit of a look this morning, excuse me, starting out. This month we're going to be looking at Moses and some of the things in his life. And in looking at uh, some of the familiar stories, came up with this title, How to Mess Up Your Resume. Anybody here ever sign, uh, submit a resume? I have two over the years, although one job I got one time, fastest job I ever got. Uh, I was in college, I was in Central Oregon, spending the summer there during their mint harvest. Worked like a dog. But then when the mint was all harvested and that was all done, I still had a month before I had to go back to school. So I went over to uh, Senex, uh, I don't know if it's there anymore, it's a place where they process grass seed in Madras. So, I went over there, walked in there. Uh, there was nobody in the office. One guy finally came in and I said, I'd like to uh, submit an application for a job. He kind of shrugs his shoulders. He reaches underneath, he pulls out a hat, sticks it on my head. He goes, can you be here at midnight? Uh, sure. And then he hands me a res and then he hands me an uh, application if I need to fill this off with the secretaries. But, I got to spend four fun weeks uh, grassing, uh, packing grass seed. Anyway, not as bad as it sounds. Found some cartoons. I'll read some of these to you. This guy says, not going to church because of the hypocrites is like not going to the gym because of the out of shape people. <laughs> I refuse to go to the gym. There's just too many out of shape folks. Why are you late, Jim? Because of the sign down the road. What does the sign have to do with your being late? The sign said, school ahead, go slow. <laughs> Just following the signs. Like, I like Randy Glassburn. I couldn't do my homework because my computer has a virus and so do all my pencils and pens. <laughs> Never heard of a pen with a virus, but that's all right. I did my homework, but when the Martians came, they sucked all the ink out of the paper. That's a new one. <laughs> so this morning, we're going to take a look at some of the ways that uh, Moses kind of uh, screwed up a resume. He's uh, being called by God, and he's responding to that, just some of the crazy things in his life. Now, Moses was tending the flock of, Jeth uh, flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land and hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Pegasites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. That's out of sight, isn't it? Never mind. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So we're expecting an enthusiastic response here. Not so much. But Moses said to God, but who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Am I sounding pathetic enough? That's what I'm going for. Okay. God said, I'll be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. 
when you have brought the people, brought the people out of Egypt, who will worship God on this mountain. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for the character of Moses. We thank you for all the <clears throat> uh, men and women of faith that we find in the scriptures. And Father, we're thankful that they are like us and they make mistakes and they have shortcomings and maybe a little bit uh, hesitant in uh, doing what they need to be doing. Father, teach us this morning through your spirit, through your word, working through your humble servant, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart should be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, one of the first ways that you can uh, screw up or mess up your resume, I was going to say the word screw up, but then I was told I couldn't really use the word screw up in church, so I won't use the word screw up in church. Is that okay? Kim's right. looking at me like, what are you doing? Right. So anyway, um, you mess up your resume uh, by lying about your birth. Okay. And Moses had kind of an interesting start. Um, in chapter 1, we find that Pharaoh was uh, hearing, uh, well, seeing that the nation of Israel was growing and growing and growing. And uh, soon the number of Israelites outnumbered his people, and he was worried. So he made a decree that the boys, basically one year old and younger, were to be killed. And at birth, the midwives, if the woman gave birth to a boy, that he would be killed. However, the midwives knew the Lord and they didn't do it. They <laughs> said, eh, we're not going to go there. Moses, Moses was a Hebrew. He wasn't an Egyptian. Hebrew woman from the tribe of Levi gave birth. He was beautiful. She knew he would be enslaved, so she put him in a boat and basket, floated him down the river, hence the name Moses. Well, it just so happened, actually the hand of God, where uh, Pharaoh's daughter was taking a bath in the river, noticed that he was floating by, took him, needed an Israeli woman to nurse him. Guess who she found? Moses' mother. So, there we go. We see a similar story in Matthew 2, 16. Story around the Christmas story. Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi. And he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with with the time he had learned from the Magi. So we, we see this happens throughout history, these horrible, horrible things where children are massacred and it's just, uh, it's unbelievable when we hear about it today around, uh, uh, around the world and it's a, a horrible thing here. I've been reading a book this week, um, actually I'm reading three books this week, but this particular one is talking about, it's called Losing Reality, and it talks about some of the dictators who have come up through history, and yeah, these dictators, um, and they're even making some comparisons to our modern culture. So he talks about um, the German Mao, 1970s China, um, Adolf Hitler, uh, currently uh, Vladimir Putin and the same ideas of why Herod and Pharaoh were so afraid of losing their power in that they had uh, gathered they had ordered their world so that not only were the people doing what they wanted done but they were also trained taught brainwashed however you want to phrase it to actually believe that theirs was the utopian society, all right? And so that would be the perfect society, which is what Hitler was trying for with the Aryan race, Chairman Mao in the 70s, uh, 
some of the things that he was doing. And behind the scenes, you just see these horrible atrocities that are going on. Even today, we're in the middle of a war, or contributing to a war, where one of the enemies is just, he wants a total race that believes in him. And I dare say the word worship, he probably wouldn't use that word. But that's what's going on in our culture today. Because these guys are so threatened by losing everything that they have amassed together that they're willing to stamp out anything that stands in its way. And history has proved that. And uh, even today, people see Christianity as a um, another kingdom that's trying to be said. It's all biblical stuff. It's all going to be happening in the end times. Oh, wait, I forgot to mention we're in the end times. And that there are uh, antichrists that come up and claim to be, we're going to be ahead of the world here. Well, they're coming and they're here. And we need to be very, very cautious about that. But in this great time of sorrow and heartache, a savior is born who will grow up and take away the sins of the world. Amen? Amen? And throughout history, it repeats that all of these other regimes have collapsed into themselves. The Roman Empire was the only empire in world history that wasn't conquered by somebody else. It just simply disintegrated because of the power of the cross of Calvary in a very uh, meek and mild way. But Jesus came to build a kingdom, not a kingdom that the world is going to recognize, but a kingdom where Jesus Christ is Lord. Did we not have the two boys repeat that in their confession, confession of faith? I believe, and say it with me if you want to, I believe. <laughs> That Jesus is the Christ, ah, Christ is the anointed one to remove the sin of the world and to set that kingdom. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I have accepted him as my personal Lord, ah, get that word, and Savior. Now I know about you, but I'm all excited about a Savior. All right? I want somebody to save me from all this nonsense that's going on in the world. It's the Lord part that many of us have a bit of a problem. Because like some of the folks we read in Scripture, I think I'll try it my own way. Moses found out in that great quote from Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? It wasn't working real well. So you can mess up your resume by lying about your birth and your birthright and all that kind of thing. You also mess up your resume by killing someone. If you have murderer listed under previous accomplishments, okay, that might be a bit of a problem. So, the passages, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, the passage back in, uh, in Exodus, we see that the, uh, the people are oppressed, put into slavery. There was a, uh, a Hebrew man that was uh, working. He gets attacked by another guy and he was killed. And so he went up, found the guy, killed him. Uh, okay, well that was that. No, somebody else, uh, there was a squabble the next day. He's getting ready to intervene. Somebody said, well, you're gonna kill me like you killed the guy yesterday? Oops. So, Moses followed the uh, nice pattern that so many people follow. When the going gets tough, the tough run away. <laughs> they split, they get going. And so he gets off in the uh, uh, Mount Horeb and he's uh, tending sheep. He's about as far away from that whole gathering as he possibly can be. But it leads us to, to just think about something. For the wages of sin is what? Yeah. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. 
a lot of times we say, ah, oh, the wages of sin is, it's death for people who commit sins that I don't commit. And the sins that I do commit, I don't think we are, God's going to actually kill me. You know, it may be uncomfortable for me. It's a very practical thing. It has nothing to do with the scripture. The wages of sin is what? Death. And so, lying, scheming, uh, jealousy, fits of rage, all those kinds of things are just as serious as murder. So, true or false, murder is a sin. True or false, murder can be forgiven. Yeah, it can. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. I'm oversimplifying it, but just let me talk about this for a minute. You see, we can see that, that um, murder is a forgivable sin because this passage in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, the, his three, uh, his close circle, and led them to a hide to a mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. What's that mean? Well, the passage tells us his face shined like the sun, and his clothes became white as sunlight. He gets closer to his deity here or about as much as they're going to be able to handle and be able to watch and be able to learn. So consequently, these Peter, James, and John are rather freaked out. And there appeared before them, there's Elijah. And who? Moses. Oh, we find Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses the murderer. Didn't you kill that guy? Didn't you try to cover it up? Didn't you run away? instead of uh, giving an account of what he did. Hmm. But Moses is there on the Mount of Transfiguration, which I find comforting, personally, because that means that my sin can be forgiven. But it also um, lends itself in a different direction. When I was preaching in World Point, I mean, I have been there very long, maybe, two, three, four years, and prior to our starting the church in 87, right? Okay. Time flies when you have fun. But starting the, starting at the church in 87, the church had had an interim minister, okay, named Bob. You Sheets. Know, uh, Sheets? Sheets, yeah. Okay, well, no, not Sheets. Wait, a Bob. Another Bob. Must be a tradition. So they had this, this other guy named Bob, and he was a preacher. And then word came around, somebody had heard that he had committed suicide. He had gotten depressed, he got really despondent, he had, you know, and so he committed suicide. Very bad thing, because some of the church remembered him. I never had the privilege of meeting the gentleman. Also, kind of on the light side, um, notice a small community. Myrtle Point's a third of the size of the law. And so, when it gets around town that a preacher at the Christian church named Bob is dead, I literally was walking down the street one day and there's a gal ran up, gave me a big hug and was glad to see me. Because she thought I was dead. You're alive! Uh, I guess you could call it that, sure. But I began to think, because I have people ask me this, what do you think? So he committed suicide. So he's going to hell. Mm. Just think about that for a minute. And I went back to this passage. Because I find that as we're looking at Moses, we find out that murder is a sin, but it is a sin that can be forgiven. Right? Did we not determine that? Okay. Then we think, well, let's see. If I kill myself, that's self-murder. And but it could still be forgiven. Ah, but in suicide, I'm not going to have a chance to repent. Weird logic there. Also not biblical. Here's how that works. Because if I believe that, then if I'm walking down the road, this is more a moral point than here, but I suppose I'll walk down the wrong road. Walking down a road, and I'm talking to somebody, and I sin, maybe call them a bad name, whatever else like that, and all of a sudden I get hit by a log truck. I didn't have a chance to repent, so I'm going to hell. Well, no. 
we would think, right? Think both of them. So maybe for the Christian, suicide, self-murder in itself would not send somebody to hell? Fascinating. I'm not saying we all go out and do that. But what I'm saying is, is that it, it gives us a different paradigm in which to look at that whole idea. That for the Christian, again, the idea is, do they know Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Savior? Have they accepted it? And no matter how they die, they're going to heaven. Amen? Well, can I still point on that a little bit? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Kind of, a, kind of what I'm just going to have you think about for a while. Because even the world does not understand that God forgives sins. I get Every church I've ever served, I get there. I get here, I get every other church I've served. All you either get the wise acre guy that says something like, well, the church would fall over if I ever came. I'm still coming up with a witty one for that, so some of my witty people come up with one for me. Uh, the other one I like is that, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. That one I can answer. I say, oh, that's true. God knows. And God forgives. Do you believe that? Well, when you're trying to come up with an excuse why not to come to church, you usually don't want the preacher to come up with a logical suggestion. So they get quiet. But the point's still there. That, yeah, my resume may not be that great, but God used Moses anyway. Be confident of this, that he, who's he? God. Yeah, when you're looking at a verse like this, especially out of a bit of, out of context, you have to know who the antecedents of the pronouns are. Uh, that he, God, who began a good work in you, okay? He begins a good work in us. This is the beauty. Now, for our two guys, okay? God's now starting a good work in them. Got that, Mason? God's doing a work in you. Now, you may not start glowing or anything like that, okay? But God is living in you and God is working in you. I, don't, I personally find that kind of cool, all right? That he wants. And will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you guys believe that? I wish God would do something in my life. Guys, that's not biblical. God is doing something in your life. Is God in your life? Yes. Does he sit around and take coffee breaks when he's hanging out with you? No. Is he working in your life? Yes. Do you like the way he's working in your life? Maybe, maybe not. That's okay. But the idea is, how is God working in my life? What does he want me to do? And, and Barbara, in her meditation, you know, just gave it out pretty plain to us. You know, go on all the world, make disciples of all nations. That's what God wants us to do. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you. God's will is pretty easy to figure out if you're reading the scripture. So you mess up your resume by killing somebody. And then you mess up your resume by talking back to the interviewer. <laughs> Moses flees from the scene. He's a shepherd, and he's kind of at one of the lowest points in his life. He'd given up a life of luxury for being a sheep, a shepherd. And, well, God's abandoned me. I don't know. Actually, God's just getting started with him. He notices the burning bush. It's kind of weird. Like, whoa, wait a minute. Hmm. This is different. Uh, Bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. What's happening? So God, God speaks out of the bush. And what do you want me to do? I want you to let to take my people, lead the nation of Israel, which ended up numbering probably about a million people, across the Sinai Desert, guided by, you know, manna and a light. Uh, you know, 
It's absurd. It's what we're talking about in Sunday school. Absurdity is one of the humor uh, mechanisms that God uses in the Bible. It's weird. Yeah, it is weird. That's how God works a lot of times. The weird stuff. So he says, I'm going to I'm going to send you. And he had every excuse in the book. And because he says, well, here I am, Lord, send Aaron. He's more articulate. He's better. He can speak better. The Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, well, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to greet you, and he'll be glad to see you. Okay. If you don't want to go and talk, I'll send you somebody who can talk with you. You can't do this. I'm going to equip you to do this. I know that you, when God calls me to do something, I'm coming up with a whole bunch of, uh, yeah, yeah, I can't, I, God doesn't call you unless he's equipped you to do that. If you're called to do a task, God has given you everything that you need to do the task. Doesn't mean it's always going to be successful. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean it's even going to be very pleasant. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But God is there. So you see Moses with a weird pedigree, stranger in a strange land. He's an impulsive guy, and God gives him another chance. How many perfect people we have here? Good. Thanks. Don't even get me started wrong. Okay. Um, he was putting his hand up for some delusional reason. Isn't it cool that God uses imperfect people? People whose resumes are a little less than stellar, that are, I'm willing, Lord. Here I am, send Chad. No, no, that's not the way the scripture goes, is it? Here I am, Lord, send me. And in those passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah, God hadn't told them what they had been doing yet. Oh, okay, blank check, wow. But God helps us, strengthens us, watches over us. Now I know we have excuses. But I want to close with kind of a true story about how God can handle excuses. Pastor Tom, not our Pastor Tom, but another one with a beautiful name. Because I can't pronounce this guy's last name. Westside Baptist Church in Nebraska. Now, Every Wednesday night, the good choir members of the Westside Baptist Church came to church on Wednesday night to practice. And practice was at 7.30. The worship leader in their church was very much like our worship leader. He just has this annoying habit of wanting people to be on time, ready to go, set up, okay? And they were. Okay. They, they were at 7.30. Everybody was right there. Matter of fact, even a few showed up early. But on one night, March 1st, 1950, they all had excuses. Marilyn, the church piano, overslept on her after dinner nap, so she and her mother were late. Girl, high school sophomore, was having troubles with her homework. That delayed her. One couple couldn't get their car started. They and those they were going to pick up were subsequently laid. In fact, all 18 choir members, including the pastor and his wife, were late. Every single person had a good excuse. So on that Wednesday at 7.30, the time that the choir rehearsal was supposed to begin, not one soul was in the choir loft. This had never happened before. But then the rest of the story, because that night, the only night in the history of the church of the choir wasn't there ready to practice at 7.30. There was a gas leak in the basement of the Baptist church. At 7.30 precisely when the choir would have been seen, the gas leak ignited by the church furnace and the whole church blew up. And the furnace was right below the choir. So, you know, we come to God and we're imperfect. But even through excuses, he's at work. Even through our frailties, he is at work. Even with our poor attitudes, God is at work. 
And I think the reason he uses all of that is so that he gets the glory. Not us, not some kind of overweight, nearing retirement kind of a guy here. For some odd reason, he sees fit to use me to do his work and his will. And I just say, praise the Lord. This morning as we come to our time of invitation and dedication in Christ alone. That's where we place our faith. That's where we stand with. All I need is Christ. I don't need the worldly trappings. I don't need anything else. I appreciate people who love us and come alongside of us. And God oftentimes uses those folks to do that. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Amen. Let's stand together, sing together. There's a uh, somebody who wants to share with us a decision in Christ. You want to be baptized. The altar is probably still sort of warm. Uh, if you need prayer, elders always happy to pray for you. Let's share this song together.